Good afternoon. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, today is another COVID Grand Rounds. I'm very excited uh, to have an opportunity to chat with Eric Topol. Let me give you the ground rules first before we bring Eric on. Uh, there they are. You know these by now. Uh, Zoom in full screen mode. I'm going to stop saying that. I think if you don't know how to use Zoom by now, we got a big problem. Uh, if you have questions, type in the Q&A box. I'll try to get to some of them. The session will be recorded and posted on YouTube tonight. Our, our uh, uh, overall, uh, I think we've had over 3 million views from our grand rounds over the past couple of years. Closed captioning is available. And if you want CME, stay on at the end of the session and instructions uh, and the barcode will be uh, given to you at that point. So without further ado, uh, let me turn to our special guest. So Eric Topol is a founder and director of the Scripps Research Translational Institute and senior consultant at the Division of Cardiovascular Diseases at the Scripps Clinic in La Jolla, uh, California. Uh, he's got a long and uh, incredibly impressive bio, but I'll do the most important part first. He was a medicine resident at UCSF. Uh, he's also editor-in-chief of Medscape and theheart.org. He's published three best-selling books on the future of medicine. Uh, highly recommended to any of you interested in the future of medicine. I hope you all are. Uh, in 2018-19, uh, he led a commission for the National Health Service in the UK looking at their future workforce, genomics, digital medicine, AI. He's been principal investigator on grants totaling at least a quarter uh, of a billion dollars, uh, including uh, leading a significant part of the NIH's All of Us Precision Medicine Initiative. He's a member of the ASCI, the AAP, the National Academy of Medicine. In 2012, Modern Healthcare Magazine uh, deemed him the most influential physician executive in the United States. Uh, since COVID began, his Twitter feed has become an essential resource uh, for individuals who want to follow uh, the, the the pandemic and particularly emerging literature, Eric has tweeted out uh, all anything that uh, that happens that's new and important uh, within minutes. Eric seems to have it up, and uh, six hundred thousand followers have recognized that. And I've told people that if you were stuck on a desert island and could follow only one person in COVID, Eric would be the person. So, uh, Eric, why don't you come on? Welcome. It's great to have you here. So uh, we're. I'm going to do a COVID sandwich. We're going to start with a couple of kind of personal questions. Then it's going to be pretty much all COVID, which is I, what I assume most folks want to hear about. And then a couple of questions at the end about kind of the future of medicine and what this leaves us with after hopefully uh, this thing goes away. So let's start with a uh, one a personal question, which is uh, it's admission season. We may have some applicants to our residency watching. And I'd love you to sort of reflect on your experience at UCSF as a resident and what it meant to you and your career. Well, Bob, first, let me just say it's terrific to be with you. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for your kind intro. Uh, as far as UCSF, I think you know I have an incredibly fond memory of my three years back in ancient times, um, 1979 to 1982, under the leadership of Holly Smith and the inspiration of Kanu Chatterjee that totally shaped my career. Uh, those three years were probably one of the three of the best years uh, of my life. Um, we had our first baby. My, my uh, wife worked uh, at the time Mount Zion uh, as a uh, midwife. Um, and uh, those, that time was just uh, hard to replace uh, over the, all the other times I've had, uh, all the other phases of my career. Um, so I, I don't know that there's a better UCSF a residency than UCSF medicine in the world. I, I have recommended it throughout. If, if you can get in, <laughs> I know it's highly competitive. Remember of uh, particular note, um, I think, I don't know how it stands now, but uh, at Moffitt, I don't know if it's still called Moffitt. Still called Moffitt. Okay, 23 admissions uh, one night. Uh, that was, uh, I got a lot of ribbing about it. And that was a very long a night. And of course, it's pretty hard to do full workups on 23 people. But um, overall, amazing experience. Um, and between the three places with the county and the VA, just uh, phenomenal. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, 23 admissions to an individual we don't allow anymore. So you'll be, you'll be pleased to, to hear. Uh, let's uh, talk just for a second about your Twitter feed. So I, I know you've been tweeting for a long time, but clearly when COVID started, you began to be quite prolific. And in some ways, your lane is this, this these extraordinary, detailed, annotated, up-to-the-minute 
uh, tweets that capture what's going on in the literature and everybody's dependent on these. And you tweeted last night, like people ask you like about your team and uh, it sounds like we're looking at it. You are, you are it. So what, what made you want to do that and how's that experience been for you? Yeah, well, just to say from yesterday, um, you know, I was on the line with uh, Carl Zimmer about a piece he's working on for the New York Times. And he asked me, tell me about your team that, you know, with your, helps you with Twitter. I said, what do you mean team? And it has been a recurrent theme uh, of questions. So for the 12 years uh, that I've been on, um, you know, I think, uh, <laughs> what, what team? I mean, I just, whether <laughs> reading the article, uh, whether it's making the graphs or analyses, it's something that I enjoy doing is, is sharing. And if we all shared uh, more, we'd all get smarter faster. So I, I've taken to Twitter, uh, obviously um, it can be vicious and bad. Uh, and there are bad days when uh, there's ho ad hominem attacks and all kinds of made up stuff. And But overall, the, I think there's a net benefit. And I think it's been great for the pandemic in terms of exchanging uh, new information, uh, ideas. Uh, I, I wish it was more collegial. I wish it was uh, something that uh, was um, uh, it, better than it is right now. But uh, overall, you know, kind of like everything in medicine, there's a net benefit. Yeah, good. Yeah, I see it exactly the same way. So thank you for that and, and, and keep it up. Uh, Let's start into COVID. Maybe just give us your, this will be very open-ended. We'll drill down to specifics as we go on, but your big picture assessment of where we find ourselves today. Right, well, uh, clearly you've been a, a real leader in this uh, as well, Bob. So, you know, these are very complimentary views. It's yours and, and many others, but, you know, I think what the real situation we're in right now is we have this maybe warped view about how mild uh, or milder Omicron is when it clearly can kill and put a lot of people in the hospital. And uh, I was really impressed with the uh, uh, Washington Post op-ed that you and your colleagues published last weekend regarding this classification of for and with the hospitalizations because it's, it's a blurred line and too many have to try to minimize the hospitalizations, which are now well over 150,000 that are due to COVID one way or another. Uh, and I think we are grossly overestimating the with rather than the for COVID. But the, the main thing here is we've got to get through this phase. Um, this is a, uh, a uh, version of the virus that has remarkable antigenic um, uh, drift from where we were with the prior versions. So that is uh, a challenge. Uh, we hope that we were seeing some early signs um, that we're going to get on this descent. There's only a few countries besides South Africa that have had that descent uh, so far, the UK, Ireland, um, and um, um, what was the third one? I'm trying to remember. I saw this I noted last night. So it's early, um, you know, and I hope that what we're seeing perhaps in New York City, DC, Maryland, uh, sounds like Northern California from the wastewater data that you just posted, Boston, maybe this is the encouraging signs that we're going to get through this descent the next few weeks. But there's a lot of parts of the country that are much more vulnerable than the ones that have been first exposed. We haven't seen it get into places that are much lower vaccination rates, much lower booster rates, much lower children vaccination rates. That's what I'm worried about in the weeks ahead. Once we get through that phase, sometime hopefully in, in February, then we'll have a better sense of whether we're moving towards some containment uh, or you know, is it just a lull before a second Omicron wave or a, yet another Greek letter variant? Mm -hmm. Do we fully understand why it comes down so fast? And the prior surges have also come down not as quickly, but is it just that you hit a level of immunity that's different or is there something about this that is uh, that we don't quite get? I think it's the latter, Bob, it's something we don't quite get. Um, any um, speculation about why the descent is, is seemingly similar to the ascent and its, and its abruptness isn't backed up by you know any any data at this point. So, it's one of the mysteries. Um, 
you know, there are, there are a few mysteries about Omicron. Um, the other one, I think, uh, right up high on the list is about the transmissibility. Uh, we know it's principally driven by the immune escape. Uh, and the recent study uh, from Isabel Eckerly and colleagues um, uh, showed that the viral load isn't nearly as high as was originally uh, uh, 70 fold increase in upper airway viral load that the Hong Kong uh, medical group had put out, University of Hong Kong um, School of Medicine. So we don't really understand it, the transmissibility, the contagiousness, if you will, beyond um, the fact that it, the immune escape, and it's just extraordinary. I mean, these are vertical lines I call the O sign that we've never seen and hopefully we'll never see again. I don't know how you can exceed it unless you go into a log plot because mm -hmm. linear plots couldn't be worse than where we are now. So that, I think those are the two biggest biologic mysteries here is number one, why is there such rapid descent? And, and secondly, um, how do you explain this hyper transmissibility uh, because immune escape only, it, it can get you pretty far, but this is extraordinary. I've sort of gone with, maybe this is wrong, that, that, there's, that, the, that the infective dose, that the amount of virus I need to hit my nose or my, my mouth is substantially lower because it sort of burrows, uh, burrows in better and sets itself, sets its shop, up shop better. Is, that, is there evidence that support? And that it sort of gets to a parallel question I was asked today and couldn't really answer. The things that we deem to be safe before, you know, outside, uh, you know, none of us are cleaning the, the the mail anymore. Should we be rethinking those because of its incredible infectivity, or are those still reasonable rules of thumb that you're not going to get it from touching something, you're not going to get it from breathing air outside? Yeah, really good questions, of course, coming from you. So I think the issue about uh, re booting some of our practices that we had abandoned like uh, outdoors uh, or fomites uh, surfaces. Um, you know, I'm a little concerned about outdoor transmission when you have something that's just so transmissible and we don't really fully understand why. The, I thought it was gonna be easy when we first started seeing a few reports about this upper airway, much higher viral loads, which has now been challenged. So it, it's not entirely clear, but I think it is still true that, as you say, the ability to get into cells of upper airway, particularly nasal mucosa, um, uh, oral mucosa, is that there hasn't that hasn't been challenged. It's just a matter of this, you know, exceedingly high viral load. So you're probably right as to how it gets in so easily and, as you say, burrows with this facilitated immune escape that we just basically don't see it. Mm -hmm. uh, our immune recognition. Um, and interestingly, you know, I think the uh, outdoor transmission, which is still probably fine, but I think why not wear a mask, uh, you know, just because we don't know. And I think this is the other issue that is uh, the inevitability camp that thinks, oh, well, so what? Uh, I think that needs to be debunked. Uh, that is obviously not the right answer. So people are thinking somehow, maybe they're not saying it, but getting Omicron is like getting a live uh, attenuated virus vaccine and that right. could be further from the truth well let's deconstruct that so the the the, the uh, inevitability camp I, I think is sort of shorthand for we're all going to get it so why even bother trying and then there's sort of the next sentence is and this is sort of my way of getting either a vaccine or a booster let's sort of talk about the inevitability um I don't think I've had COVID yet I'm trying my darndest not to get it for the next three weeks <laughs> or a month um, is that, that, it sounds like that's where you are as well. You still feel like it's not inevitable that everybody's going to get it. I think Fauci may have confused things a little bit. It probably is inevitable you're going to be exposed to it unless you're hiding under your kitchen table, but it's not inevitable you're going to get it. Is that where you have landed? Absolutely. Um, and I think it was unfortunate when both uh, Janet Woodcock and, and Tony made comments about, you know, most people are going to get it or everyone's going to get it because that kind of really fosters the sense of inevitability. Uh, we don't want that. We actually don't even want to be exposed, ideally, right? Um, so I think the idea is, and you put it really well there, is get through these next few weeks where there's such high circulating virus, uh, then we, you know, regroup. But let's not invite a, an unpredictable virus. It can cause long COVID. There's some rationale why that would be a concern. 
It can cause secondary attacks to people who are immunocompromised, uh, uh, you know, unwittingly getting somebody very sick, even if you are not in some high risk group. Um, so, you know, I think the idea of, um, of this inevitability, we want to move away from that and protect everyone, protect ourselves. And speaking of debunking, you came down, as did many other people in the know, on an editorial in the Wash in the Wall Street Journal the other day, that <laughs> I'd say already pushed the button there, uh, that made the point that somehow everybody just getting it is really good because it'll help prevent variants. So, why don't you tackle that one? Well, that was amazing to me. I, in fact, I almost was tweetless. That was a new wow. <laughs> so incredibly stunned by this that some that this couple could publish and the wall street journal would publish i mean i guess in light of other things they put on their editorial page i shouldn't be surprised but here uh, basically the exact opposite of everything it's like turning the world upside down about the pandemic and saying that essentially we should have chicken pox parties and and speed the spread can you imagine speed the spread uh, they acknowledge that there may be a little risk involved. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> that would be the way to preempt variants. I mean, help me. The whole <laughs> idea is that we do, we want, we don't want to cultivate more variants. That's why we, you know, do things like try to avoid overwhelming medical resources and overwhelming uh, the the cultivation of um, infections. I mean, my goodness, this to go here in January 22, our third year of the pandemic, to reach something like this, it was just extraordinary. Yeah, wow. Uh, almost tweetless. I hadn't heard that term before. I like that. I, I, I never made it. I, <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's, let's pivot to testing, which is complicated and messy and beset also by shortages and to some extent gotten politicized like everything else. So we'll just kind of talk us through kind of what you think about the role of testing now. Uh, there was some early reports that maybe rapid tests don't work as well against Omicron. And then some of our colleagues here just published a really important paper showing that it did seem to work as well. So how are you, we'll get to the isolation guidelines and the day five issue after that, but just talk about sort of how you were thinking about testing today. Yeah, I'm into the rapid test, and I haven't seen any convincing data that they don't work well. Um, your, your, uh, the UCSF report and others since then have all reinforced that they, their performance is, is quite reasonable. They're not perfect. And as I think people know, you need to have multiple tests to be more assured. You need to be testing you know, very proximal in time to a gathering if you want to really get a, the right readout. There are differences between these rapid tests. Uh, but you know, I think like, for example, today, the UK, uh, England uh, specifically changed their isolation period to five days, but that's with two days of a rapid uh, test. And they have had that practice of two days consecutive being negative before uh, getting out of isolation. And that's the way the best practices of all the countries that have been relying on rapid tests. We're the only major country uh, that hasn't had rapid tests and has had a cockamamie idea that was put forth that we should stop isolation in five days without a, a test of any kind and just wear a mask of any kind. Mm -hmm. That to me was one of the real low points of our CDC, unfortunately. So your feeling is that UK or England at least has gotten it right, that, that at five days test, and if you're negative and you're asymptomatic or your symptoms are better, it's okay for you to go out, but you should be wearing a good mask. If you're positive, you stay in until you're negative for two days. Is that how you think about it? They had a very important paper, you know, preprint this past week that if you're at five days, a third of people are still going to be positive. Right. So like your son, I think, right? Where yeah, he's still positive on day seven. I, I, I tweeted last night, I love him dearly, but I wouldn't want him to breathe on me. And I've gotten a lot of, you talk about the Twitter blowback, I've gotten a lot of blowback today about what a terrible parent I am. So I'm still reeling from that, but I'm trying to trying to get through this. Let me say, I couldn't be further from the truth, okay? Thank but <laughs> as, far as, as far as, you know, it is mostly at day seven, day eight, when people turn negative. So but day five is pushing. But so what the UK has done, just like you know many other countries throughout Europe and, and in Asia, is 
two days of negative tests. And typically, you know, day five is early. So for, for the CDC to recommend this with no evidence, knowing best practices of other countries, I hope they know them, uh, that promotes spread. That, that's the kind of the opposite of what they're supposed to be doing here. Yeah. Um, but I think the rapid test uh, should not be undermined by some, you know, what I would consider very scant, small numbers of people where, you know, this charge of reduced sensitivity, we've all known, and Michael Mina uh, has led this, you know, for the whole course of the pandemic, that it, it, relying on just one result uh, when you're trying to make a call about isolation isn't ideal. And that's why, you know, I, I really think they're important. I wish we had had the supply um, situation remedied a long time ago. You know, just like when we called for uh, the KN95 and N95 masks that be supplied to everyone, rapid test. Here it is, you know, uh, more than a year later, and finally these things are starting to happen, but of course, much too late. And what do you think happened? You know, I think both of us know a lot of the people in the administration, they're smart and they're good. <clears throat> do you, uh, is, it, is it your sense that they just put all their eggs in the vaccine basket? They figured the vaccines would get us out of this mess and we don't have to think very much about masking and testing and all those things? Is that sort of what went on? Well, I mean, I, it's hard to make it as a real dichotomous decision, but clearly they were leaning that let's uh, bet big on the vaccines and de-emphasize the others. So there were many things that were de-emphasized. So not just the fact that um, the rapid tests, we shouldn't you know, get them and distribute them, uh, that we shouldn't. Uh, another one that was a big one, uh, Bob, was about the Paxlovid story. So you know, my understanding is that uh, Pfizer, uh, Merck, and Roche, the three big pill uh, companies that were going into testing, uh, by that point, late phase testing, they approached the uh, um, the administration to say, "Would you like to put in, you know, big orders for Paxlovid, which turned out to be the we, we don't know about the Roche drug, but and the Merck uh, drug has you know a lot of questions about it. But Paxlovid is an exciting and I believe the second most important advance as far as after vaccines in the pandemic. Yet we don't have it essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so they were asked to put in an order and they declined." Uh, the reason for that decline was, I guess, two things. One is the big bet on vaccines and the fact that this wasn't proven yet. There hadn't been, you know, the, the, the two phase three trials that ultimately were done recently. Hmm. Um, so you could say, well, they made a big bet on vaccines with Operation Warp Speed, but they weren't willing to make other big bets. And, and certainly getting rapid tests, getting, you know, I, I envisioned back in 2020, that distribution of really high quality masks with USA on every mask uh, would be a way to build spirit and patriotism, something we don't really have as far as the divisiveness. But you know, we haven't used some of the other tools that we could have to help us get through this. And the biggest one to me is the lack of data navigation, the lack yeah. of data uh, capture. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to get back to that in a second. Let, 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 let's, let me finish with testing one last question. Your read of the evidence in terms of the, the throat plus the nose, the nose alone, the throat alone. <laughs> had, if you were testing yourself or a loved one today, what would you, what technique would you use? Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. I mean, I, I think the anecdotes are very uh, supportive. I'd like to see a little bit more data. I mean, I don't, I, I, if you have a lot of test, it'd be fun to compare, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't know um, for sure uh, on that one. I, I think there's some rationale for it, uh, as you've pointed out. Um, it wouldn't hurt, perhaps, but it's something I think is a little bit fuzzy still. Okay. This is the, the, for, for, if you're not up to speed on this, there's some, some maybe fuzzy literature that maybe your yield is a little bit higher if you do the throat and then you do the nose. And in terms of grossness, I think that is the order you want to do them in, <laughs> as opposed to the opposite. So uh, that's what we've we've been doing for a little while. Uh, all right, let's go to Paxil. We'll get to the data thing in in a little bit. So you made the point that it's you know it's maybe the second biggest scientific advance after vaccines. Um, and I think you wrote recently. Uh, you came to understand the manufacturing process, and it's really tough. It's not like you can snap your fingers and produce a billion of these pills. So what, what did you learn about that? 
Well, you know, I looked at the molecule and, you know, it's been a long time since organic chemistry, Bob. So I figured, well, it's got some fluorines in there, but hopefully <laughs> a small molecule that could make the stuff, right? Uh, I found out subsequently, uh, particularly from Derek Lowe, um, that it does involve not just a lot of uh, steps, uh, complex steps because of these uh, moieties in the molecule, which uh, was published in Science uh, by the Pfizer team. And, you know, a couple of points, this was the first uh, directed drug, not a repurposed drug to be shown to be effective against the virus. Um, so the structure was published. And uh, I think the idea was w w how hard would this be to make and of course, Pfizer told uh, back, you know, last summer, they told the, the, the US government, it takes, it's complex to make, it takes several months to make a massive supply. That's why we need a big bet from you. So they didn't make, they didn't go to mass scale, but as it turns out, the rate limiting step here isn't necessarily the, st the steps of the organic chemistry, industrial chemistry, but rather the materials, the raw materials, which mainly come from China and they're of limited supply. However, you know, now there's a, a, a Bangladesh uh, generic company that's making Paxlovid. We don't know how they're going to be able to scale that, but they have gotten an emergency authorization um, to do that. Um, and in India. So, I, you know, I think the production story, um, that because of the rate limiting material issue, uh, is a concern. And the fact we do have a very limited supply and even the 80 million blister packs treatment courses that are promised by Pfizer by end of this year, uh, seems to me, uh, unless there's some surprises that come when we get, uh, uh, you know, wide scale use, it's very insufficient that I wish we could get, if we had this in every medicine cabinet, uh, wouldn't that be nice in case you got a new diagnosis and you were starting to get some symptoms, you would uh, essentially be able to abort the uh, replication of the virus. It's not dependent on your immune response, which is really important. It shouldn't, uh, no variant should affect it in the future because it's dealing with MPRO, the main protease, which has only one mutation in it after two years. So it's not a region of the virus that's prone to mutations. So I, I think this is, this. I called it a just-in-time breakthrough because in fact with Omicron, you know, it couldn't have come at a better time. The, the short supply is what really is distressing. And when it is in better supply, uh, does it replace monoclonals? Does it does it just become the thing you do if you're an outpatient, you're diagnosed with COVID? And does it become Tamiflu that everybody takes it, or it still is you take it if you're at particularly high risk? Yeah, really great questions. Uh, you know, I think the supply is going to be the constraint, so we won't be able to have wide use. Um, there are some issues, practical issues we can get into, but. You know, to me, uh, for example, right now, we have a really serious healthcare workforce issue. If we had abundant Paxlovid, one of the other major features of this drug, because it, it hits the choke point of replication, that you get more than a tenfold drop in the viral load very quickly. So, you know, you could have, um, you know, somebody, uh, whether it's a nurse, a physician, a uh, clinician who uh, gets um, COVID and you could basically you know, stop the transmission very quickly with a pill or a few pills, whatever. So that's another thing. Wouldn't that be nice to have in our armamentarium right now? Um, there is a concern that if it has wide use, would we then select uh, for, um, you know, put pressure on the virus? I mean, I don't know how realistic that is because this is such a conserved region. Um, you know, but I, I think it would be ideally the thing where you started to get some symptoms or even, you know, you, you, uh, potentially known exposure. I don't see the role of intravenous monoclonal antibodies. Uh, right now, only one of them may work. Uh, the uh, sotrofimab is the only one that seems to hold up against Omicron. Um, but that requires an infusion. Uh, and then remdesivir is three days of coming back for infusions. Uh, here you get the same near 90% reduction of uh, hospitalizations and deaths with pills that are easy to obviously implement. So um, I see this as basically um, becoming the main go-to strategy. And if we had it right now, it would give us a lot more confidence to, to basically get through the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, I, I see it exactly the same way. 
Uh, is it known that it decreases transmission or just we're extrapolating from the viral load data that it must? No, no, the uh, studies have been done, very good studies with uh, not just viral load and copies and yeah, more than tenfold reduction in both of the, uh, of the trials that were done, the high risk and the standard risk trials. Great. All right, let's let's move. Uh, uh, well, let me ask that's sort of a couple of other politically challenging questions. One is the schools. It's probably the the hottest issue, and people are so passionate about it. How do you feel the schools have been handled, and um, and 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 what do you think about the schools now? Should they be open, or are there circumstances where you think it is reasonable for them to go virtual for now? Uh, well, this drives me a little nutty. Uh, the, the reason, I mean, most everyone I know wants the schools to be open. I, I haven't met anyone except maybe a kid that doesn't like school that doesn't want the schools to be open. So what gets me here, Bob, is that um, we have, of, of all the children in this country, um, you know, the 83%, uh, uh, the parents of, I mean, of these kids, 83% don't want to, haven't had their kids vaccinated, 83%. Now, if there's a better way to keep schools open, besides having the teachers and the staff and the, you know, the bus drivers and the kids all vaccinated, I don't know of a better way to do that. And here we are in this unique position of having abundant vaccines that are remarkably safe. I mean, the data for age five to 11, you just can't beat that in terms of safety. A total of 12 cases of myocarditis that were self-limited in 9 million doses of vaccines. I mean, help me. I don't know of anything that's as safe as that. Uh, maybe even more safe than water. I mean, it's amazing to me. And yet we have all this made up stuff to disinformation about children with the vaccine. So we have a way to get schools in really safe mode. No less, of course, with you know the the mask and other uh, the filtration, the, the better air quality, ventilation, all these other things. But the vaccines are you know the simplest way to accelerate safety, and we're not using them. And there are most countries in the world, you know, you know the lower middle income, they can't even get vaccines. Period. And we have these. We have uh, you know FDA go ahead, and we're not doing it, and it's shameful, really. And I've got you know grandkids, and my my seven year old soon to be eight, has had his two doses of vaccine and, you know, his school is doing well. But, you know, I know, look, we, we are all well aware of schools that are shutting down all around the country. Uh, and this is a serious problem. And you sometimes hear it, you know, almost as in doctrine, the, the worst mistake we made last year was closing down the schools. We should never do that again. I assume there might be some point where you would say that you have to, right? Is that is that the way you think about it? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing here about is not just the bonus effect of keeping the, the schools open by vaccinating children, uh, but it's also the idea that what about these children networks with their families and all the other people they connect with? What about the idea that uh, should, kids do get long COVID at a half or a third of the rate of adults? Um, and then, you know, also yesterday in the New England Journal, there was a new study that was in the teens from you know, 12 to 17. It was incredible in terms of 98, 99% vaccine effectiveness against ICU, life support, uh, need for hospitalization. There were seven people who died in the study, teens, and they all were in the unvaccinated group. How much data do we need to be compelling? Mm -hmm. uh, I, it's extraordinary. So yeah. all children should be vaccinated and um, you know, it's really, it's amazing to me and depressing. We've even had to use the word mandates. Uh, who would ever have heard that in prior times of this country? Uh, but, you know, th this is uh, part of our era today and it's, it's really sad. Yeah. So you brought up long COVID. Um, you've read the literature better than anybody around. What do you think the prevalence of it is? Uh, what do you think the prevalence is likely to be with Omicron since it's probably too soon to know for sure? And how much does, does vaccine, vaccination help you prevent it? Really important questions. I wish we had all the answers. Uh, we have not had near as much uh, of answers and definition about long COVID as we need. Um, so as far as the incidents, obviously in part how you define it, you know, when you make the call, you know, is it after 12 weeks? 
uh, and then the, the extent of the disability, but it obviously can be a major league disabling chronic condition. Uh, I have colleagues uh, at Scripps Research with long COVID, young, healthy people who still have really serious problems in, in functionality. I'm sure you do at UCSF, Bob. This, this is a real deal. Maybe it's 10%, maybe it's a little bit lower, but you know, it just depends on where you draw the line uh, of you know, not just fatigue perhaps, but you know, the mosaic of different symptoms. Um, with Omicron, there's two ways it could go. We have no data on long COVID. We only made the diagnosis through the South African efforts of their biomedical community in late November. So, you know, that was the beginning of the Omicron uh, time and it'll take months before we get a read on that. But there's a reason why we would think it could be worse with Omicron. And that is, uh, first of all, we know most long COVID occurs with mild infections, some moderate. And so that's where the preponderance of long COVID occurs. And secondly, Omicron, because of its immune evasiveness, there's an important study today in nature immunology, which shows how there's persistent immune dysregulation eight months after mild COVID infections in people with long COVID. Hmm. So the point here is that if you have immune escape, uh, uh, this is the most immune escape we've seen by far of any version of this virus. It could make it more difficult for people to get over it. That is anti up to the immune challenge, the antigen challenge. On the other hand, um, because it may have less tropism, we know that this is a case for lung cells. We don't know about other organs, tissues in the body. You can make a case, maybe it will be lower, but right now we should plan for the worst about long COVID and this whole idea of having you know, millions of infections per day and it's inevitable, basically ignores the long COVID concern. The last point you asked about is about, will vaccines be protective? As, as you know, Bob, there are a few studies now suggest that if you're vaccinated, um, the chance of getting long COVID is reduced, perhaps halved, perhaps a third reduced. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that's still, we have no randomized trial data. It's a little bit tricky to make the call on that. Um, so, you know, I think that's still questionable. Uh, the whole immune side of this versus non-immune mechanisms of long COVID uh, or their combined features is also, you know, very hard to dissect out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, the, what I find interesting is you hear all the time, I'm really worried about the long-term side effects of the vaccine. And I say I'm about a thousand times more worried about the long-term side effects of COVID. <laughs> Which yeah. uh, I mean, just I think you brought sure. that very well. Um, okay, let's talk about February, March, April. Uh, you've already made the point that we could find ourselves in a pretty good place. Cases coming down, quote a milder virus around, more doses around of a of a really effective oral medication. Uh, so, but the questions then arise: the likelihood of a new and even nastier variant that wins the race against Omicron. Uh, the, the risk for, of reinfection, uh, how well does your Omicron infection protect you against future infections? And more generally, how good is your immunity that you get from an Omicron infection? It feels like those are the two variables that determine whether we have just a good spring, but a terrible fall or a good spring and we're sort of out of this pickle. So how do you see those two things, sort of the risk of a new variant that's worse and, uh, and, and how good the immunity you get from Omicron is? Right. Well, um, these kind of questions led me um, over the weekend to write a substack about, you know, we're, we're very lucky because we have uh, so far our vaccine directed to the ancestral strain is held up amazingly well for severe disease hospitalizations against Omicron. That is the three dose with the booster has 90% vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization. In fact, in the 65 age group plus, 94% uh, and after 10 plus weeks dropping down to 89%. I mean, these are great data that from the UK uh, from, uh, and uh, you know, I think we're very lucky. The worry I have is that we could see a variant, uh, you know, uh, that is probably hard to get one more transmissible I mean, really, I mean, how are we going to see something more transmissible? But we thought that with Delta and then we came Omicron, right? 
but where I think the liability is in more um, uh, antigen um, shift, more uh, what we see of, of immune escape that may evades our vaccines. Because if that were to happen, there we're lucky because if our vaccines weren't holding up, even two shots get you 50% against hospitalization. If our vaccines weren't holding up, we'd be in big, big trouble right now. Mm. But because we've got 62% of the American population vaccinated and 23% boosted. I mean, that's giving some Omicron defense, no less some of that prior COVID that helps as well. So um, we may not be so lucky the next time. And if there's one way to hurt us as a, as a species with this virus, it would be immune escape. And just because they have an Omicron specific vaccine in March, so what? You know. The, the point being is we could not have predicted this hypermutated Omicron. No matter what AI tool you have or human intelligence, these specific mutations that are littered all over the virus, not just in the RBD and the spike, but you know throughout the virus, no one could have predicted this. All the experts of virus evolution pretty much thought it would be a Delta plus, and then came this out of the you know, what a curveball, Omicron. So we don't know what's in store. And we have to be, you know, truth telling about that. We could see an, uh, a variant that's worse. And that is why, Bob, for a long time, uh, Dennis Burton, our chair of immunology, and I wrote in a year ago in Nature that we need a variant proof vaccine that is a pan sarbacovirus or pan beta coronavirus vaccine. And we haven't gotten all over that. That's what we should have in clinical trials right now. There is one from Walter Reed that's getting into phase two, but we should have multiple candidate clinical trials, an equivalent of Operation Warp Speed to protect us against a possible worse than Omicron variant. Then uh, with that uh, and the treatments that are getting you know better, then we would have a whole lot more confidence uh, in, in getting over the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And you think that's feasible? You think that if, if we lean into this, there it is scientifically feasible to find something that, because we didn't predict Omicron, but an, a, a pan variant vaccine would have been effective against it and effective against something that's even better than Omicron? Yeah, that's a really key point now you're making. So there have been more than 15 broad uh, neutralizing antibodies, BNABs, uh, 15 different reports from centers, uh, mostly in the US, but some international. Uh, these are derived, these are treasure hunts in people in the less than 0.1% of people that make these incredibly multipotent antibodies, sometimes directed against cryptic epitopes. The point being is that when they expose to Omicron, now that that has been uh, updated, they hold up really well. They hold up, you know, because you're basically taking down the virus in conserved places. Uh, you're, you're, you're basically coming up with a way that should be variant proof, right? Because it's so broad and so potent and it's made by humans. Uh, it's just a very rare, the, the, the rare people that can make these things. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're doing is once you find these BNABs, you then reverse engineer a vaccine to make them. The pro and you could make multiple BNABs in a vaccine, right? The problem we have is there's no connection between the academic labs that are coming up with these BNABs and showing their extraordinary potency, broad potency, with the vaccine companies that are willing to take the risk to make the vaccines that are pan coronavirus. We don't have any, we don't have Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, &J, any of these companies. They rather make Omicron specific stuff. Yeah. And so we have no coordination. We have an NIH, you know, uh, consortium, uh, uh, we uh, that just was you know started with a few centers, but there isn't that kind of operation warp speed where you get public private partnerships, you take a big bet, you get into clinical trials because the only way you're going to be able to tell if it's pan coronavirus and variant proof is getting it out there mm -hmm. and showing that whatever this freaking virus you know uh, shows us that we can um, uh, protect against it. Um, so it's a very, it's kind of like a uh, comparison I'd make with the longevity pill. You don't know if it really improves longevity until you follow it for a while, right? Yeah. And that's kind of what a pan coronavirus is. It's a challenging, but it's something we should be doing. It's a low it cost, as we uh, put, it, put forth in, in nature a year ago, for what the bang that we could get out of it. 
And then thank you. And then just in terms of if, if your immunity came from an Omicron infection, I'm guessing you're not going to get vaccinated if you haven't gotten vaccinated so far. Hard to believe that you're going to change your mind, although I hope so. Um, how long and how robust do you think that's going to be? And how long do you think that's going to last, assuming that Omicron remains the major threat? Yeah, well, like all your questions, they're really terrific. I mean, I think depending on what comes next, uh, if it has even more shift, Omicron infections may not be protective. I think the key point here is the separation between, you know, T memory B and T cells and neutralizing antibodies. So the more you get vaccines, vac boosters, and infections, if you are unfortunate to have those, the broader your recognition is in your memory uh, in BNT. So that will help for sure. But it's the infection part that is um, not, not the severe disease part that's the liability, and then the spread that comes from these infections. So as you pointed out earlier, we're seeing a lot more reinfections of people with prior COVID with Omicron. Mm -hmm because of that alien antigen, if you will. And we don't know what this next one's, we're gonna have another variant, let's, let's face it, right? Uh, hopefully uh, it would be something that is even less, less, less severe than Omicron. I try to avoid the term milder because it's taken the wrong way. But, um, you know, we, we just don't know. And I think our best bet, knowing how many disappointments we've had and bad projections, it's always plan for the worst, mm -hmm. hope for the best. I'm a very optimistic person. Yeah, no, I know that. <laughs> um, maybe the last COVID specific question that I'm going to spend uh, we have a little bit of time talking about kind of what we've learned in the future of medicine. Um, if somebody uh, called you today and said, uh, you can get your fourth Pfizer or Moderna shot right now, I don't know what you've gotten before, what would you say? Um, well, you know, I think there's a real important question there. Uh, as you know, in Israel, there in people over 60, they're going forward with that. Um, they're the first country uh, that have, has done that um, beyond you know, immunocompromised people. Um, and we'll see data. Um, I have to say one thing, Israel has been calling the shots right every time, mm -hmm. even though it's been somewhat dissed by um, people at FDA and CDC uh, at, at points along the way. So we'll see. But, you know, uh, if you're in a high risk situation and you're now six months past your third shot, and not so much that you're worried about severe disease, I think you're probably okay with that third shot for, for hospitalization protection. But if you're really uh, worried about an infection and, you know, being pretty sick, uh, we, that's where we don't know. And a lot of us uh, in the healthcare, workforce are getting to that point mm -hmm. of, on the brink of protection, which really starts around four months, right? So I think this four shot uh, in, in people, you know, of advanced age is a, is a real question that we'll know the answer. Israel is great about getting that data out. And as long as we uh, develop the trust in them, which they deserve, uh, we'll get an answer uh, probably in the weeks ahead. So that's a good pivot to um, a, 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 something you were beginning to talk about, but I, I, I sort of moved it along, but let's get back to it. Uh, you know, up, up until two years ago, you'd see a paper in a journal and it was from, from UK or from Israel or from South Africa and say, oh, that's not America. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for the study to go. Whereas for the last two years, it seems like almost all of the insights or many of them come from studies from other countries. Um, they have better data systems, they are investing more in clinical research. What's going on and what do we need to do to, uh, uh, to, to be leaders in this area? Because it really feels like we're followers. We are followers and we have pathetic data uh, systems. I mean, pathetic. Uh, and the one thing that really strikes me, Bob, is that you know we, we of course support the current administration and you know the fact that the mantra of sticking to the science but there has all these announcements from day one of taking on administration through today. There has not been one, one mention of improving, improving our data system, not a mention. And this is just preposterous. Yes, we are forced to rely on other countries' data, but when these advisory committees for FDA and CDC convene, they basically you know, are unwilling to accept that data, even though there's not data here in this country. Because like, for example, right now, we wanna know 
these Omicron boosters, how well they're working to prevent hospitalization and deaths. And when do they wane? When does their protection, those people who are getting hospitalized who had a third shot, what's going on there? We were promised by the CDC in May that they would track every breakthrough hospitalization and death, never happened. And so we don't have critical data. We have 150,000 plus people in the hospital. And I have begged at the HHS level that we have granular data on each of those people. Uh, their vaccination status, which vaccine, when they got it, their age, their coexisting conditions, and all the, the basal stuff, right? And they say, we're going to look into it, even though it can be mandated by HHS authority. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, uh, you know, just a dreadful situation here where we don't have real-time capture of data. The only data that gets posted on the CDC uh, is a month old, and it's de minimis about things like hospitalizations or deaths. And this is unacceptable. If you're gonna go in a pandemic and try to um, deliver and guidance, you have to have data. That's how you develop trust. That's how you, you know, have the best navigation system and we don't have it. But the most important thing to me, Bob, is there's no seeming will to get one. And that is distressing and it has to change. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, the main thing to me is that we have a secretary of HHS, uh, who came from California, the attorney general, he hasn't shown up for the pandemic. Have you, have you seen him? Have you seen I, him I, make I, a statement? I saw him talking about how the CDC director doesn't have a degree in marketing the other day. That was interesting. I see, I see. Yeah, <laughs> we, we have a serious problem. HHS, there's been a lot of infighting between the agencies and the HHS secretary should be put, put, you know, bringing that together and, so we have a serious problem is we have a no show HHS secretary, we have an HHS that is not that could mandate this data capture, but they're afraid, in, in my view, of political backlash. That's why they're not doing it. And uh, you just can't. Yeah, yeah, we're a big country. Uh, but you know what, a big country without data is, is a is a is a horrible situation. So we have to rely on other countries. And, um, you know, fortunately, we have amazing data that comes out of places like the UK and Israel and, and, and Denmark, South Africa, so many that uh, has been terrific for us. But it's amazing. We have a different population here. We're much less vaccinated, much less boosted. We have lots of coexisting conditions that are not so, as prevalent in some of these other countries. And yet we don't have data. And yeah. We, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I just... Um, I don't think that the administration has delivered on sticking to the science because part of the science is having the data. Yeah, makes sense. All right, we only have about seven minutes left. I want to sort of pivot to uh, a little bit out of COVID and into stuff that you've thought about more deeply than anybody, which is sort of where the healthcare system is going and particularly the digital transformation of medicine. You know, I've sparred about this in the past because um, you know, sort of you've taken a relatively optimistic view and I've taken one where sort of it's a little more bumpy, but clearly COVID has moved things along. So what are the, the, the as you think about how the healthcare system is going to be transformed by technology and AI and all of that, how do you think COVID changed that trajectory? Well, it certainly uh, accelerated the telehealth. Uh, story, which has been good to see. I think we're going to rely on that more over time and that telehealth will go to 2.0 with won't just be a video exchange, but exchange of real data, uh, multiple types of data. Um, so I think that that's a good move. We have a long ways to go. The digital medicine revolution uh, is still in the earliest stages. Um, you know, I'd say one thing that we're going to see a lot more of is doctorless diagnosis screening. So whether it's uh, things like we already have a, a, a smart watches that can pick up uh, heart rhythm abnormalities, but that's going to extend to urinary tract infections, ear infections, skin lesions, and uh, most of the common disorders that are not life-threatening. That's already getting rooted, and that uses, uh, of course, uh, the person capturing their own data, like what we've seen with a, a rapid test or obviously from yesteryear pregnancy test. But also now algorithms, because these are more complex, they're not from chemical reactions. Um, and so accurate screening is going to be something that's going to be big, uh, getting a lot of legs. Virtual coaching for chronic conditions and then ultimately to prevent conditions. We're seeing a lot of that in 
diabetes, uh, hypertension, and other things. So I think you know AI combined with um, real uh, world world data, high frequency or continuous data, uh, is going to be a very important movement uh, in the in the next couple of few years. But uh, obviously, we have a lot of work to do to validate these algorithms uh, and these you know, deep neural networks that are transformative potential. But most of them are based on in silico data or our FDA cleared without the medical community ever seeing the data. Yeah. And one of the, I guess one of my worry when I talk to our faculty and ask about burnout, you know, obviously COVID is probably number one. The second is the amount of stuff that's coming in from patients in ways that couldn't have happened before, whether it's data from their watch or mostly it's just questions or I've just, my magnesium's high. What does that mean? Or it says my EKG is abnormal. What does that mean? It feels like we're building the connectivity and democratization uh, and more patient facing systems, but then they still link to our legacy doctors and nurses and institutions and it's sort of breaking them. So do you think sort of the future is there's just less of that back and forth because there's more things that can actually get diagnosed by the system so the patients don't need the, 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 the old healthcare system? Is that the way this is gonna play out? Well, I think that's unfortunately how we're set up. It would be great if we had all this integrated. Uh, other countries have been able to make that move, but we're we're stuck. Um, but I think that the combined effects of uh, uh, basically deep learning, um, both for the clinicians as well as for for patients, um, has a decompression uh, effect of being able to have restoration of the human connection in medicine, which obviously has eroded so, so substantially. Uh, if you go back to, you know, my old days at UCSF to now, it's unrecognizable in terms of what is the typical human connection in medicine. So I do think that giving empowerment to patients who are willing uh, and also on the side on the clinician, helping them dealing with data uh, will make this a better uh, form of medicine in the years ahead. And that, that excites me about where this can go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I think the question is a probably pretty bumpy phase until we get there. And I think that's what we're all experiencing now. Eric, we only have a couple of minutes, maybe just last couple of reflections on sort of big lessons that you've taken away and, and or things that were meaning, particularly meaningful for you over the last couple of years. Oh, uh, I'm always learning a lot every day. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I think uh, the, the pandemic experience obviously has been humbling to try to keep up with what's going on, where, you know, the advances that we're making on the science and then the lack of advances we're making on human behavior uh, and, and being able to titrate, counter the, the mis and disinformation, which has been stunning. Uh, you know, I, I still remember that day seeing the first, you know, 95% efficacy from you know a phase three 30,000 participant plus trial thinking this is it and and you know basically we've ruined our chances by mm -hmm. not having uh, so what I've learned is you know obviously um, human behavior and the power of misinformation and disinformation is far beyond what I ever estimated it's it's more than sobering and it's putting us in this current phase in a highly vulnerable position. I don't even know where the limit will be on hospitalizations and deaths in the next few weeks because it, you know, we're just so less prepared than the countries that have already sustained through their Omicron surge. So uh, you know, I, I, I don't, the divisiveness, the politicization of the science and the mask and the vaccines and the boosters, I mean, all this has come as a shock to me, uh, the extent of it. I mean, sure, every country has some of this. Mm -hmm. Nothing that I have seen to the extent as has occurred in the United States. Yeah. Well, it's a sobering note to, to finish on, but it's obviously true. And you have done more than almost anybody I can think of who is to combat that and to put great information out there and make it available. And I'm grateful, and I know everybody who's watching is grateful to you for doing that. And I, I hope you can keep it up. It's, uh, it's been immensely helpful. Thanks so much for having me and all the great work you're doing at UCSF. I'm always cheering for my alma mater there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Next week, we go back to a non-COVID uh, topic, um, uh, looking at uh, the future and the present and the future of diabetes care. Uh, thanks for tuning in and stay safe.